carbon-plated shoes change running as we know it. But while the carbon plate gets all the credit, it's the foam that does the work. So today we're looking at the foam your super shoes are made of as we investigate super foams. Early running shoes were simple and functional, often made from leather and rubber. It wasn't until the 70s that a breakthrough in cushioning and technology arrived. Ethylene vinyl acetate, or EVA, was provided lightweight cushioning and stability and pretty much revolutionized the industry. And then in the 80s, polyurethane entered the scene. And this provided more rigid support and stability for those runners who needed a bit more support in their running shoes. Then the 2000s saw the emergence of thermoplastic polyurethane, or TPU. Adidas's Boost technology was the greatest leap in running shoe technology that the world had ever seen until 2017. Then everything changed. Nike introduced the Vaporfly. The headlines all focused around the carbon fiber plate, but the actual groundbreaking technology in the shoe was the foam. The foam was PIBA, or polyether block amide. PBAX was a variation of the PIBA foam developed by chemical company Arkema, and Nike used this foam in their Vaporfly, built around a carbon fiber plate, to create a shoe that was light years ahead of the competition. So what is so special about this foam? PBAX has a unique combination of lightweight properties, exceptional energy return, and high durability. It had actually been around as a foam for decades, but it wasn't patented until 2004, and Nike was the first to use it in shoes. Contrary to what many believe, Zoom X, Nike's name for their PBAX, is not actually a Nike invention, but a product from a UK-based company called Zote Foams, and that product was based on the PIBA technology of Arkema. At this point, you're probably wondering why all the headlines were about carbon plates when it was the foam that was the thing. Well, there's two possible reasons for that. Firstly, companies have been spouting about new foams for decades, whereas the carbon plate was something new. It was new technology that the media was gonna grab onto. And secondly, perhaps cynically, it was in Nike's interests that everyone focused on the carbon plate in the shoe, particularly because they didn't actually own the patent to that PIBA foam. To be fair, without the carbon plate, the foam was probably too unstable to create a good shoe shape anyway. The secret behind PBX lies in its molecular structure. It consists of rigid polyamide blocks and flexible polyether blocks. This combination allows the foam to be significantly lighter than traditional EVA or polyurethane foams. But it wasn't just lighter, it also provided significantly better energy return. How much better? Well, remember that world's previous best foam, the Boost from Adidas? Tests showed that that provided less than 76% energy return whereas the new Zoom X equipped Vaporfly from Nike provided a massive 87% energy return. With the launch of the Vaporfly, Nike did something else significant, almost seismic in the world of running at the same time. They proved that consumers were willing to part with massive amounts of money, roughly double what any running shoe had ever cost before to have the fastest shoes on their feet. Now, every brand out there needed to sell $250 running shoes. The Super Foam arms race was on. Since 2017, every major shoe brand has launched their own Super Foam, building their shoes around carbon plates and coming up with their own names for their version. You would need to be a full-time student of running shoes in order to know every foam and its particular properties. Some offer superior energy return and bounce. Others offer plush comfort. Some offer performance at affordable price tags. Others sell increased durability and some simply claim to have the perfect balance of lightness, energy return, and durability. Zoom X, Flight Foam, Light Strike, Power Run, Nitro, V Foam, Energy, Boom, Helion, the list goes on. The only thing to slow down the arms race a little was intervention by World Athletics. It was inevitable really that something would have to be done. You see, previously, the gold standard running shoes was lightness, and more foam meant more weight, meant less lightness, and less performance. But now, with these super foams, they were so light and the energy return so great that adding more foam more than offset the extra weight. It was only a matter of time before we were running around in 100 millimeter high running shoes. 
World Athletics stepped in and put a limit on that stack height of 40 millimeters and also a limit on the carbon fiber plate where you could only have one, at least in competition anyway. The arms race continued, now just within narrower parameters. When it comes to these premium super foams, there are a few factors you need to consider. Firstly, durability. Now, manufacturers will claim different amounts of durability, but the reality is most super foams lose their magic after about 250 kilometers of running. Now, you can keep using them for running and training quite fine until about 500 kilometers, but the reality is that after about 450 kilometers, most super foams are only as good as EVA. Another consideration is so-called foam fatigue. As you can imagine, running thousands of steps in it, your shoes, pound some of the life out of them, some of the bounce out of them. This is not permanent damage, and they do recover from this, but it takes some time. Interestingly, EVA has almost no recovery time. It doesn't lose any of that initial 70% energy return. It still has that even after miles and miles of running. Whereas super foams gradually lose their energy return. They may start high at like 90% energy return, but before long, they've lost all of that bounce. In fact, it can take 48 to 72 hours for super foams to recover their energy return after a long or hard run. It's probably not long before we see super shoes coming out with some kind of recovery timer before the next wear window once the foam has recovered. Another factor to consider is temperature sensitivity. Some super foams lose a lot of their bounce and energy return when they get really hot, they get softer and more compliant. And others get really brittle and fragile in really cold conditions and don't perform well, say if you're running in sub-zero temperatures. So you need to know how your foam responds to different temperatures. It is safe to say that no company, not even Nike with their multiple year head start, is currently happy with their current foam. New foams have been released all the time, as well as new combinations of foams. And that's actually an important point to point out because foams are being mixed to increase their durability or improve their performance or simply to reduce their price tag. So when it comes to choosing your next pair of running shoes, the question is probably not, does it have a carbon fiber plate in it? But rather, what super foam is it made of? And what are that super foam's specific strengths and weaknesses? And how long does that super foam last? And what is its temperature sensitivity? And uh, is it mixed with other super foams? And, and, and. We're most likely not at the end of the super shoe arms race. In fact, we're most likely at the beginning. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, hit the thumbs up button so we can keep making more videos like this. Hope you've enjoyed this one. Goodbye.